All right, you guys, let's go ahead and flip that worksheet over now then. And uh, on the back side is where they talk about logarithmic equations. And logarithmic equations are just like they sound. They're equations that have logarithms in them. But not just any logarithms. They have logarithms with variables inside of the product term, all right? Uh, and so what strategy do we want to take in order to uh, deal with that? Let's talk about that. Uh, we have not seen other than one problem. We saw one problem back in 4.3 where you had a log equation with a variable inside of the uh, product term. Uh, and what we did was we, uh, and you have to have the log has to be by itself, meaning it has the log, the base, and the product term. No other stuff on that side of the equal sign. If that's the case, and you have a constant on the other side, okay, uh, there's a variable in there that's different. Uh, it worked out here in, uh, in similar problems here, but uh, when you have a, a log with a variable in the product term, you want to have the constant on the other side. Um, otherwise, it's going to cause all kinds of uh, other issues. Uh, these other problems are different, though, because it didn't have these same circumstances with the with the variable inside the product term. So that's different. But you want to have that constant over there. In fact, it mentions this here in our current section. Uh, it says that you want to have the log by itself and a constant on the other side. If you have that, then step one is complete. If you don't have that, then go ahead and get that done before you move on to the second step. All right. So anyway, what did we do in that step here once we had the log by itself and a constant on the other side? We then rewrote it where the base and the exponent were together, and they were equal to the product term over here by itself. That's exactly what the second step is, is to rewrite it with the base B and the uh, uh, exponent, which is Y, because again... Logarithms are always equal to exponents, so that means the y is equal to the exponent here. The base and the exponent go together, and then the product term, which was x over here, now becomes the thing that's all by itself. We're going to do that exact same thing right now. Okay, so, uh, but the first thing, like I said, the first thing you got to do is you got to get the log, or in this case ln, same thing, by itself. Meaning the, the log along with its base, which is the invisible e right here, and then the product term x, you gotta get that by itself. As we uh, already mentioned in this section and in previous sections uh, before, uh, if you wanna get something by itself, pretend like it's a variable. How would I get the y by itself? You'd divide by three, wouldn't you? Therefore, you do the same thing here. You divide by 3. And we get ln of x is equal to 3. Once you get the log by itself with a constant on the other side, what do you do? You take the uh, base, which is e. All right, remember that's the invisible base here because it's ln. You take the base. You take whatever uh, the log or ln is equal to, which is 3, and that becomes your exponent and then the product term is all by itself. And that's great because that means that x is all by itself. So we're pretty much done. Now, it does say give your answers in exact form. That means, you guys, that if you stick this answer into your calculator right now and it gives you one of those decimals that covers your entire screen, that means it's not exact. That means they rounded it off. If it doesn't cover your whole screen, all right, if it just covers part of it, it's a decimal that covers just part of your screen, then that's an exact answer. You can give that as your answer. Um, if I put e to the third in my calculator though right now, you guys, it will be one of those decimals that covers the entire screen. So I'm gonna stop right here. Normally you would put that in there because if you got a constant number, uh, take into a constant power. Don't just leave it like that normally. All right. Uh, that's something that you should simplify. Just like if you had like a two to the third is your answer or four to the third is your answer. You're not just going to leave it like that. You're going to figure out what that is. Uh, so normally you would put this in your calculator and actually give that answer that you, that the calculator gives you. But, um, because it's not going to be exact, you can and should because the directions tell you to, you should. Just leave it like that, all right? And so that's fine.
Next one here, once again, we have a log by itself. It's a very, very big product term, but because of the square brackets there next to the four, which is the base, that tells us this, this entire square bracket is our product term. And so the entire left side of the equation is just the log, its base, and its product term. If it's just those three things, then you're good as long as the other side is a constant number with no variable, which it is. And so that means we can go on into the second step, uh, which is to what? It is to uh, take the uh, base and the exponent together, put the base and the exponent together, and then the product term then is by itself. All right, just like in the last problem as well. So um, the product term, it doesn't matter what side you write it on, but uh, the product term is by itself. You don't need the square bracket because the thing that was inside the square bracket is just gonna be by itself. And so the square bracket then becomes unnecessary since that square bracket, there was nothing outside of it. Like we said before, if you have just a bracket on one side of an equal sign with nothing outside of it, then the bracket uh, is not necessary. All right, uh, four to the third go together. What I want you to do though right now, uh, we weren't able to do it in the last problem because it had to be an exact form uh, and it was the end of the problem. But when you do the base and the exponent together, go ahead and figure that out right away. Especially since we're not at the end of the problem here. We wanna figure that out so we can then use it here. Uh, four to the third is 64. Okay, now we've got a normal looking equation. All right, uh, it's uh, typically gonna be, in other words, you got rid of the log. Um, it's, we just have polynomial type of stuff here. No, no ra radicals, no you know, uh, exponential where you got a variable and an exponent, no logs, all right? None of this stuff other than just uh, um, a situation where if you uh, multiply out your parentheses, it looks like it's gonna be a polynomial on both sides, and it's probably gonna be either linear or quadratic. In fact, I'm sure that it's gonna be quadratic because if I distribute this out, the highest degree term is gonna be three x squared, isn't it? And if you end up with a polynomial on both sides, just a bunch of regular terms being multiplied to, or uh, being added and subtracted together, regular monomial terms like we talked about at the beginning of the semester, all right, no radicals, no, uh, like we said, none, none, none of this other stuff, no radicals, no fractions, no uh, uh, logarithms or exponentials, um, none of those things, uh, no fraction exponents or anything, just the normal, you know what, let me just give you a visual of it. Uh, pulling out the prerequisite review packet right here. Just your normal looking terms, okay? Like we defined terms at the beginning of the semester. Again, just reviewing here that when you have just those things being added and subtracted together on both sides with no parentheses anymore, and I got rid of those because I knew that the, it was gonna look like that after I got rid of the parentheses. I knew I would just have those types of terms being added and subtracted together on each side. It's at that point that you say to yourself, okay, is it linear? or is it quadratic or is it uh, is the highest degree term higher than two? Well, because the highest degree term is two, we then realize it's quadratic. And so the, at that point, we decide what kind of uh, method we're gonna use. Uh, I typically, um, when I've got this many terms especially, uh, and in particular, um, it looks like uh, the x term is gonna remain even after I combine like terms. If the x to the first term remains, we're not gonna do that square root property thing that we've seen before where you do the double square root. So in that case, what I typically always do, if you're not gonna do the square root property, is just to move all the terms to one side and then um, try to factor it. So what do we get? We get three x squared, minus 10x, and then this is what? This is minus 114, okay? Um, and then we have to try to factor that thing. 
Okay. So how should we go about that? And I, you know what, I stand corrected. That's minus 112. Let's fix that. So you know, that's not the easiest thing to factor right there, but let's see if it works. Okay, three times minus 112. I'm doing the Berry method that we learned in the prerequisite review packet. Three times negative 112 is um, negative 336. Negative 336, what two numbers equal negative 336 that will uh, also add up to negative 10? Um, to save time here, I know this is not something that I'm not expecting you to figure this out in two seconds. All right, you need to use your calculator to help you out and stuff, but it's gonna end up being negative 24 and positive 14. That'll add up to negative 10 and it'll equal this. So use your calculator to help you figure out problems like that, especially when the numbers are that big. Okay, but what does this lead to here? This leads to, according to the Berry method, we're supposed to, since this is 3x squared, we're gonna have 3x and 3x. We're going to have minus 24 and plus 14, but then you got to factor out the GCFs out of this, uh, out of these brackets here. The first bracket has a greatest common factor of three, so I factor that out and I discard that uh, GCF in the last step of the Berry method. Again, please review your factoring if needed. Okay, I know some people are still struggling with it, so. Um, and then I set these brackets equal to zero. That's the zero factor property from the uh, section 1.4 when we talked about how to solve quadratic equations. All right, section 1.4 if you need to review that as well. What do I get here if I then get these equations? These are both linear now, so I solve them in the normal linear way. X equal to eight, and then if I divide out right here, I get X is equal to negative 14 thirds stop right there for a moment okay um we need to um actually you know what i won't talk about that yeah i'll talk about it eventually don't worry you're not missing anything here it's no need i was about ready to mention something but um i'll mention it here coming up so don't worry um but it's not necessary on this problem, and I'll explain that as well, so that's why I'm not gonna mention it yet. Number eight. Okay, notice in number eight, uh, similar to number six, uh, we don't have a single log by itself on one side of the equal sign. Okay, in fact, I have two logs in the problem, so what happens when you have two logs in the problem, uh, what you can do if they're not on the same side is get them on the same side. So if you have a log being added or subtracted with a, uh, another term over here, like three, um, and if this had been minus, you, it's just like a normal term where if uh, it, because this is being added to the three, we're gonna subtract the entire log. You cannot separate the log from its product term. You gotta, it, the whole thing has gotta move, all right? You can't just move the log uh, by itself without moving the x plus three. All right, you can't just move the x plus three without moving the log. It, it all goes together. No log can be separated from its product term, all right, um, unless there's a property that allows you to do that. Uh, maybe you separate part of it like we've seen, but um, when you're moving it from one side to the other, it's gotta all go together. All right, you can, you, like I've said before, you can't just have a log, the, you can't just have the letters L-O-G without, without its product term. Um, logs mean nothing without their product terms. Anyway, So those cancel right there. We just have three by itself over here. The reason why this is gonna work is because I now have that property that we talked about in the last section, uh, 4.3, that says what? It says that if you have the 
log minus log thing going on, okay, when you have log minus log, you can then combine that into a single log, which is exactly what we need to do right now uh, because the first step of the log equations requires that. So what I do is I go log and then um, because it's minus, it becomes a fraction, doesn't it? Like that. And that makes it into a single logarithm. Okay. So now I finally have a single logarithm with a constant on the other side. Just like we said, that's what you need to do in order to go to the next step. The next step is to take the base, which is an invisible 10 right there. It now needs to become visible. All right. So that you can take it to the third power. And then we have this right here. How do I solve this equation now? Um, first of all, make sure that you uh, convert this, uh, like we said, when you get the base and the exponent together, because they're both constant numbers, uh, no use in leaving it like that. Compute what that's equal to so that you can work with it. That's gonna be um, a thousand, isn't it? A thousand equal to this fraction. And, Whenever you have a fraction on one side of an equal sign and just a regular term on the other, you make the regular term into a fraction so that you can cross multiply. Put a bracket around the x plus 3 because it's got two terms and you're multiplying it by something. So that's required to put the bracket there. Let's finish this thing off. This is a normal looking linear equation now, all right? Uh, after you distribute out, like we said a few minutes ago, after you distribute out, you've got just polynomials on both sides. Uh, regular monomial terms being added and subtracted together. Um, and so you just got to figure out if it's linear or quadratic after you get rid of the brackets. And sure enough, it is quadratic. I mean, I'm sorry, it's linear because there's no x squared there, it's just x. All right. So I need to move over to the 11. If I move over the 11, I get, uh, oh, I'll write that down in a minute here, hold on. And then I need to move over the 3,000. And I get uh, 989x equal to negative 2,991. So then I need to divide out to get the x by itself, right? And finally, the x is by itself. Do not circle the do not circle the answer. Okay. Remember back in chapter one, and I'll I'll um, remind you of it here as well. Um, in chapter one, we learned that when you have fraction equations that you had to solve one variable fraction equations, you had to check your answers. And sometimes it gives you bad answers. Sometimes it gives you good answers. So I circled some of them and some of them were bad. All right. We also learned that with radical equations, radical equations, you got to check your answers. And sometimes they're bad as well, as you can see here. And sometimes they're good. That's why I circled some of them. Okay. So we let's review here. Fraction equations, you got to check your answers. And my directions in chapter one uh, remind you of how to do that for the future. Okay. Uh, whenever you do that in the future. Um, same thing with radical equations. And uh, again, if you review this, it'll show you how to do that uh, for whenever you need to do that in the future. But uh, also, the third time when you solve a one variable uh, equation, the uh, third thing that you need to consider when it comes to checking your answers is that if you have a logarithmic equation, an equation with a logarithm in it, in particular, and this is why I didn't do it on the first two problems, it's when you combine two logs into one using either one of those two properties. If you combine two logs into one by using one of these two properties, right, one of the, the first or the second one, okay, at any time while you're solving a logarithmic equation, it is possible that you got a bad answer. And not always, 
Okay, like I said a few minutes ago, all right, uh, sometimes you get good ones, sometimes you get a bad one, all right, but uh, when you combine those things, it will sometimes lead to bad answers, all right? So that's why I need to check this. Now, the way you check it is kind of similar to the fraction equations, all right, where you don't have to check the entire problem, all right, you just have to check... Uh, kind of similar. Uh, remember when we had to we had to check to see if the v denominator was zero in the fraction equations, and that's why both of these were bad. For example, each one of them had at least one uh, denominator that was equal to zero when we plugged it in. Can't have any denominators equal to zero. Well, it's the same idea here. Remember, I said on the front side of this worksheet we can't have any negative product terms. All right. Does this answer make either one of these original product terms in the original equation negative? If it does, then you got to throw it out. If it makes them positive, then you're okay. Okay, now you might be thinking, I don't want to plug in that nasty looking fraction into these product terms. That's fine. Okay, there's a way around that. What you do is, and I, I know I said I wanted an exact answer here, and I still do, but we can at least approximate this just for the purpose of plugging it in, not for the not to give the answer. But see how this answer here is is 3.0 something, but it's actually negative because it's negative divided by positive. Okay, so I'm going to make this negative by multiplying it by negative one here. So check this out, you guys. See how that answer is. Uh, just a little bit uh, off from negative 3 right there, negative 3.0 something. What happens if I were to plug that into the x plus 3 right there? Let's find out. So if I plug this thing into the x right there, I'm going to add 3 to it to get that product term, aren't I? Let me do that, x plus 3. And I get a negative product term. So if I plug in that number and I add 3 here to get this product term, which is the entire bracket, I get negative. It's a very small negative number, but it's still negative. All right, that means that this answer is not good. Okay, so we're going to cross that out and we're going to get what? As we saw in the past, if... Uh, if there's no answers left after you check your answers, then you have no solution. You need to say that. Just like with the fraction equations, with the radical equations, if you check your answers and there's no good ones left after you check them, you need to say those two words. Don't just cross this out. But say those two words so that I know that you understand that there's really nothing left. Uh, nothing that's hidden or anything. There's nothing left. Okay. By the way, if this had made this product term positive, which would have been okay, you still need to check the other one, all right? Uh, and if it makes either one of them negative, you gotta throw it out. Only if it makes them both positive is it okay. But since it made this one over here negative, I just stopped right there. I knew it was already bad because if either one of them's negative, it's bad, okay? Okay, now in nine and 10, you guys, uh, we have an alternate strategy just slightly different, which is going to be a little bit easier. Let me look in the front side of the worksheet here and show that to you right now. Um, instead of doing the thing where you get the log by itself equal to just a constant, what you can also do, it says down here, is you can make both sides of the equation into a single logarithm. Kind of like, kind of similar to that ABAC formula. I'll show you what I mean by that in a moment. But, um, if uh, you, so, in other words, you have two choices here. Whatever's easier for you, I'm good with. Okay, but if you can get the log, just one log by itself with a constant, just a normal constant number, no log on the other side, that's fine. If this is easier to do this instead, then go ahead and do that. Okay, and you'll see that that is easier here. Okay, because we already have logs on both sides, don't we? So I would recommend doing that secondary uh, idea right here when you already have logs on both sides, okay? Uh, so this log is already just a single log. We need a single log on both sides if we're going to use that alternate formula. So all I got to do then is combine these two logs into a single log, and then I'll have a single log on both sides. How do I combine that into a single log? I realize once again that if I have log plus log, 
then that becomes multiplication right here when you combine it into a single log. So let's try that here. It says that if I want to combine these two into a single logarithm, my product term becomes x times 3x minus 13. That's your entire product term right there. Okay. Now I have a single logarithm on both sides. All right. Um, what does that mean? As the property says, and it's again, it's kind of like that A, B, A, C thing again, where uh, something cancels out. All right. Same thing here. See how where it says uh, log base B of X, log base B of Y, the logs basically cancel out. All right. And I know I said that you can't separate a log from its product term, all right? And that's not what's really going on here. What's really going on here is that if you've got two logs that are equal to each other, you guys, and they have the same base, doesn't it make logical sense that the product terms would have to be equal as well in order for the whole thing to be equal? That's all that we're saying here. All right, so I'm not separating the logs from the X and the Y. I'm just saying that the product terms have got to be equal. So you could just you could just write it so that the product terms are equal to each other and make the logs go away. So I've got two logs, both of them by themselves on each side of the equal sign, both of them with the same base. They both have an invisible 10 there because there's no base that you can see. That means it's an invisible 10. And so the product terms must automatically be equal to each other and you can make a brand new equation out of that and that is going to be a normal you know polynomial equation okay meaning that if I distribute out my parentheses here uh, it's typically going to be a polynomial on both sides here uh, that's what I meant by a polynomial equation if you clear out the parentheses you got a polynomial on both sides it's at that point once again that you ask yourself is it linear or is it quadratic you're usually going to get one of those two things after you get rid of your logarithms. All right. We've seen that in these uh, previous problems here. We're seeing it again here. It's just that on the last one, you had to do the cross multiplying first as well. But eventually in these problems, you're going to get either a linear or a quadratic normally. Um, and because of the X squared, this is quadratic. So... Let's try to do the factoring method, the zero factor property from chapter one by moving all the terms on one side. We'll do the Berry method. Because we have all three of these terms here, x squared, x, and constant, we're going to do the Berry method. 3 times negative 10 is negative 30. What two numbers add up to negative 13 that multiply together to be negative 30? That would be negative 15 and positive 2. So I go like this. I go 3x and 3x because that's 3x squared. I get 3x minus 15 and 3x plus 2. Factor out the greatest common factor out of each bracket. That makes that x minus 5. The 3x plus 2 has a GCF of 1, so if I factor it out, it's not going to change it. And so, therefore, I keep that the same. We're almost there here. Uh, what do we got here? If I set these equal to 0, I get, uh, on the first one right there, I get x equal to 5 if I solve for x, correct? On the second one here, I get... Um, Move, these are just linear equations now. So I move the 2 over with the 0. I divide out the 3 and I get negative 2 thirds. Okay, remember, you got to check your answer. Why do you got to check your answer? Because I combine two logarithms into one by using one of those two properties that I pointed out earlier when I was talking about checking your answers. All right, so you have to check it when you do one of those two properties to combine two logarithms into one at any point during your problem. And if I check five, let's just check it out here. What you do is you check your answer into all your product terms. This one you don't have to check because there's no variable there, just the ones that have variables in it because there's no place to plug the five into here. But if I plug the five into here, I get a product term of five. As long as it's positive, that's all that matters. 
Uh, if I plug 5 into here, I get 3 times 5 is 15, minus 13 is 2. That's still positive. Remember, the entire bracket's the product term there. So this one's good. But what's wrong with this one? It's not because it's negative, you guys. It's because it makes the product term negative. It could be negative and still not make the product term negative. That would actually be okay. But because negative two-thirds makes this product term negative, if you plug it in, the entire product term is the same thing. It's negative two-thirds. That means we're going to throw it out. It can't make any of the product terms negative. So once it does make one of the product terms negative, just throw it out. And so we only got one answer left. Okay. Finally, number 10. Once again, we have logs on both sides. So I would recommend, all right, uh, using this property right here as an alternate to this one. All right. Um, I know we had logs on both sides uh, here, okay, but the difference was that this was not, uh, this was just a normal term, and so it made it easier to just move the two logs together and then get the three separated from it. What I meant by logs on both sides in the last couple problems and, and doing the alternate uh, method is if everything's a log, okay? Um, not the case here because uh, you've got just a normal term right here uh, being added to the log. When you have a normal term being added or subtracted with a log, I would recommend that you get that thing by itself so that it can then be, it could then be that constant number right there, assuming that's a constant term, all right, which the three is. All right, so if you've got a regular constant term, not a log, um, and then you have the rest of the problems just got logs in it. I would recommend you move all the logs to one side, and then that becomes your constant number that you use in the original method here. Okay. But if uh, if you've just got all logs, all right, with some of them being added or subtracted together, like you can see here, but otherwise everything is just logs on both sides, no regular terms other than inside the product terms, but no regular terms that uh, aren't logs like the three, okay? And that is a regular term that's separate from the log because the plus, when you have an addition or subtraction, that separates it from the log, and so that's just a normal term. That is not a log, it is completely separated from the log by the addition, all right? So that makes it uh, separated and so you put the logs on the other side so that, that can be the constant number that we use in that method there where we say 10 to the third. All right. The point is, is that whatever, ultimately at the end of the day, you guys do whatever's easier. All right. Um, and I think you'll find here that it would not be very easy to do the secondary method I've been doing the last couple of problems. But because I could subtract over that logarithm, all right, uh, then you can um, you can uh, use that first method, all right, where you just have the constant number on the other side from where the logarithm was. Anyway, let's get started here. But yeah, do whatever's easier. You can see here that doing the secondary method is not that hard because if I condense these two logs down into one, I will then have a single logarithm on the left. Let's write it down. And then um, using that fraction property because it's minus like that, and then since the other side already is a single log, we now have a single log on each side. Okay. Um, and so, because we have a single log on each side, and they both have the same base, that means that the product terms are automatically equal to each other, so you can make a brand new equation without the logarithms now. All right, and we can cross multiply here, realizing that three is the same thing as three over one. We can cross multiply, and we get what here? We get five x plus, pardon me, five x minus six times one. Okay, uh, and that is uh, equal to three bracket x plus one like that. All right, uh, and that's just a normal looking. Uh, uh, polynomial equation after you clear out the parentheses. What kind of equation is it going to be after I clear out those parentheses? Is it linear or quadratic or something else? 
it is linear because it just has x's, right? It doesn't have x squared, it doesn't have x to the third or something higher than that. It's just x. So I'm going to move over the x's to the same side. I'm going to move the 6 over with the 3. And then if I divide out, I get 9 halves. If you get a fraction answer, I wasn't when I said earlier that you put it in your calculator. You don't have to, you don't have to put it in your calculator unless the um, you don't. In other words, you don't have to make it into a decimal. Is what I meant. You don't need to make it into a decimal unless they um, unless I tell you to. Uh, and I it, when I tell you to, usually that's uh, usually I'll say round it off to the nearest three decimal places or four decimal places or something like that. In this problem, it says exact form. Now, even though the decimal answer is exact in your calculator, this would be 4.5, you can still leave it as a fraction. Just please make sure it's in lowest terms. All right. Usually when we get a fraction answer with just a normal single number on the top and bottom, not one of those bigger fractions, all right, just put it in lowest terms, and that's usually fine, even when they ask for an exact answer. But because the decimal answer is also exact, since it does not cover your entire calculator screen, all right, um, that's also okay. All right, what's important is that you don't give an answer that is that is one of those big, huge decimals that covers your entire calculator screen because they ask for an exact answer. And I circled this, by the way. I actually circled it a little bit quick, but uh, you'll see why it's okay here. The 9 halves, if I plug that in, and you could do 4.5 if you're more comfortable plugging that into here instead of the fraction. I know I am. Uh, either one of these answers are acceptable. But uh, 4.5, if I plug that in, 5 times 4.5 is 22.5 minus 6 is still positive. I don't care what it is. I just know it's positive. It's actually 16.5. But as long as it's positive... And then if you plug it into here, you get 4.5 plus 1, uh, which is 5.5. Again, that's positive. That makes it okay. And then this one, you can't even plug it into that. That's positive. Uh, and there's no place to plug in anyway. So all of the product terms are positive uh, for this answer. And that's the reason why it was okay for me to circle that. So again, let's review here. When you... Uh, do the logarithmic equations, all right? The equations with the logarithms in it, with the, with the product terms that have variables in it. Get the logarithm by itself on one side, or if you have logarithms on both sides and you don't want to move them all to one side like it did here in number eight, okay, try to then get a single logarithm by itself on both sides, all right? It's up to you which way you want to do it, whichever way is easier. But remember, if you have a logarithm on one side only, make sure the other side's a constant number. Just a normal constant number, no logarithm over there, no variable. All right. Then you use the appropriate property, whether it's uh, for this one, you do the base and the exponent together. Or in the case of uh, when you have a logarithm on both sides, just a single logarithm uh, by itself on both sides, then you cancel out the logs, basically. Uh, and so either way you're eventually going to end up with a polynomial equation, either linear or quadratic, and you solve that. But just remember, after you solve it, you got to check your answers if you used one of those two properties that we talked about uh, where you combine the two logarithms into one. All right, uh, either one of those two. Uh, if you did not use one of those two properties while solving the logarithmic equation, which was the case up here in these first two, we did not use either one of those properties, then you still could check your answer. You just aren't required to. All right, so that concludes uh, logarithmic equations and 4.5 in general. Uh, so as usual, let me know if you have any questions about 4.5 or uh, anything else in Chapter 4, and uh, you have a good day. Take care.